believers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and risen Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let's back up a little bit. Sometimes I, I wonder and scratch my head how they put together the revised common lectionary so we have our readings on Sunday. But this is one of those Sundays I'd like to just stand publicly and commend them. They put such a tight uh, reading together with both the Old and, uh, Testament and the Gospel that we really can't miss what's going on here. This, this Gospel text uh, is flushed out by that Old Testament reading uh, that Dean gave us earlier. And, and what it is talking about here is this parable of Jesus placing back into the memory of ancient Israel and us this process that God is engaged in. He begins by talking about a man who creates a vineyard and plants it and does all of these things expecting this vineyard to produce exactly what he planted in it. And if we sit for a moment and start thinking about it, isn't that the very beginning of, of the Old Testament? Bereshit barba Elohim hashamayim. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, he did it this way. God's expectation in that Garden of Eden was for perfection for you in this kingdom here and now. And then the fall took place. And everything became chaotic once again. And it's hard for God to gather things in, to put a fence around chaos, to keep the wildness out and the good growth in. And the Old Testament talks about this vineyard older one good grapes in there. And Jesus talks about the vineyard who, owner who wants good grapes in there. And what he's talking about is the life of the people who live with God. And we know that that crumbles outside, away from not a part of God. And yet, it seems in that Old Testament text that it doesn't work that way. That sometimes the, the, the wildness creeps in. And sometimes the wildness lives in there with evil. And so we come across the parable uh, today of the wicked tenants, it's called. And this, this parable is, is sitting there, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders and people go, aha, we've got this, wait a second, he's talking about us. Now, if they were Lutherans, hmm? They heard that and would come, oh, we were damned, right? We were ready for that. But they didn't. Usually we don't do such a good job of that either. We, we pass through it so fast. But Jesus is not just talking about this, this, this vineyard that the vineyard owner has perfection in store for and then sends his messengers there and they kill them. Oh man, if you read more of Isaiah and the other prophets, you'll hear lamenting about them, the, the people killing God's prophets. Jesus wraps all of Jewish history up into this one simple little parable that lasts about 14 verses. He wraps all of their experiences into that, and he ties it neatly together. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees realize, oh, he's talking about us. Rather than repenting and returning back to God, they decide on something else. We like to rid ourselves of this man. To get rid of what he's talking about. To end his voice. That's how it always ends. It always ends with the people who don't want the prophetic word chasing it out or killing it. But Jesus doesn't back away from what he says. No, instead of backing away, he steps even closer to them. And he speaks of another image that they fully understand. Have you never read the scriptures? They have. They had to admit at the very beginning, we've read the scripture. Whether they read it to had it read to them and heard it that way or read it themselves, yes, we've, we've read the scriptures. Then you've heard the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. <clears throat> this is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes, right? And it was, and they understood that. What's a cornerstone? Well, for us, it's the side of a building 
And it's a different color type of stone, and it says the year in which the, the, the structure was constructed. Typically, rather pontificating, you know, the year of our Lord, 1627, you know, or 1929 AD. But that's not the cornerstone in ancient Israel. That's not the cornerstone in ancient construction. Uh, Randy and Ron and the rest of our engineers will get this. The cornerstone is the very top of the arch. And if you look at any pictures of medieval and earlier architecture, you will see an arch in the very top. There's a different shape and style of, of stone up there. And oftentimes, most frequently, they look like a wedge. They build that arch and they put the wedge in there and all that pressure comes and that wedge holds it. You want to bring that structure come tumbling down? Knock that out and it'll collapse. That's the cornerstone. It isn't down here. It's up there. And it holds everything up. It keeps chaos from crushing down on your head. And Jesus said that. The people who did well and use that trip and stumble because their buildings won't stand. And when that cornerstone gets old, it all comes crashing down. And they understood that. All of human history is going to come crashing down. What happened in the moment of Jesus' death in the story of his passion? Great thunder and sound. Why? The cornerstone came crashing down upon the head of evil. And Jesus wraps all of this stuff in. But we're getting close in our lectionary reading to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. We don't start with the resurrection next. We start with his birth coming up in preparation with that and then into Christmas. But we're getting close to the end. And Jesus says, this is how it all ends. The one who owns it all finally has had enough and sends his son and says, they shall respect him enough. And he sends them. And they say, hey, if we kill him, we get his inheritance. And when he comes, they put him on the cross. And they killed him. And they were right. This is how it ends. Not with the stone that crushes the believers. But the stone that rebuilds the new kingdom for the believers. Jesus is working to invite you into the next kingdom. Where he dies on the cross and rebuilds it, that kingdom upon himself. And indeed, it ends this way. You inherit. In spite of all of man's plans and schemes and wanderings away from God, you inherit what the Son came to bring, eternal life. That's how it is. With life.